Romano Fanati was struggling through his first season in Moto2, Grand Prix Motorcycle Racing's second highest circuit. Through 11 races, he hadn't yet reached a single podium. He was getting desperate. So desperate, he'd do anything to win at the 12th race, San Marino, just two hours from his hometown. Even, apparently, attempt a murder in the middle of the race. Before Fanati, there was a hotshot driver barely old enough to drink who used his schnoz to terrorize the entire sport, and an ex-con turned racing manager who ordered one driver to throw a race so his other driver could win, and a boundary breaker in rally racing who miraculously emerged from the West African jungle with a car that ran like new. What do all these people have in common? They're cheaters. Specifically, some of the most dirty, rotten, dishonest, incredibly creative, downright awesome cheaters in racing history. There's always been a thin line between competing and cheating in motorsport. In fact, it's generally a safe bet that almost everyone is cheating almost all the time. But occasionally, someone comes along and blows past the cheating line at several hundred miles per hour, giving it the finger as they go by. Sometimes those people win trophies, sometimes they lose everything, and sometimes they get the greatest prize of all. We get to talk about them on Past Gas. It's time to pry off our restrictor plate and see what this podcast can really do. Today on Past Gas, six of the greatest cheaters in the history of racing. Past Gas Podcast, it's about cars, it's not about sports. Big thank you to Auto Tempest for sponsoring this episode. Guys, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know how much I love Auto Tempest. They're one of my favorite sites. I use it literally every week. Auto Tempest is a used car search engine that saves you the hassle of checking a bunch of different websites for used car listings. Auto Tempest pulls in results from all the top listing sites in the US and some in Canada so you can find everything in one place. You can also use Auto Tempest to open matching results at classified sites like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist Nationwide. So no more going from site to site, you can find all the cars in one place at autotempest.com. And that's why their slogan is autotempest.com, all the cars, one search. Every week I have some new automotive obsession this week, it's the BMW M240i, because I drove a BMW yesterday and now I want one. I'm sure you guys can relate. Auto Tempest makes it super easy for me to indulge my automotive fixations, and you can too. Head on over to autotempest.com slash past gas. Let them know we sent you. Thank you, Auto Tempest. The greatest prize of all is love, um, actually. <laughs> Was that the Beatles? Is that a Beatles lyric that you're referencing? I don't know. I've, I've I heard one Beatles song and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> "Why is this guy? Why is this guy singing about a raccoon?" I just watched the this documentary called 1971, the year that music changed the world, and you can see John Lennon see how profitable like political activism is yeah and in real time be like oh, i've got a fund a cause to write a song about and <laughs> cash in on this like you can see it happening in his head and him trying to like do the mental gymnastics in front of the camera to be like look i just like learned about all these people in bangladesh let's write a song about them <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, this is not a music podcast. This is an automotive history podcast. Welcome to Past Gas, everybody. It's been a while since uh, we were all in the recording stew together. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co hosts. We got James Pumphrey, toot, toot, <laughs> and Joe Weber. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Hope everyone's keeping it juiced. Fired up. Wow, dude, you've really worked on your radio voice since we've seen you. That is, <laughs> yeah, I've been DJing good. at a bunch of strip clubs in the meantime oh, while cool. you guys have been gone. <laughs> um, we've been replaying our series on Smokey Eunuch, one of the greatest cheaters of all time, and that kind of leads into today's episode. Uh, more cheaters, six of the greatest cheaters of all time. Um, I'm really excited for this episode. This is always a fun topic to cover. Um, you know, sabotage clever ruses perhaps <laughs> of the automotive variety loopholes in racing are fairly common very common i'd yeah, you say gotta, you gotta race the rule book 
you know you got to exploit the rule book as much as you can and that's why there's always like rifts between teams especially recently with mercedes and red bull yeah all the mercedes drivers lewis hamilton was drinking so much red bull (laughs) and made him so alert and they were like hey buddy maybe try some water sometime thank you (laughs) that was crazy scandal (laughs) yeah monster energy was not happy about that wait does monster sponsor mercedes (laughs) that'd be the weirdest fit ever really yeah whoa what yeah i feel like mercedes would be sponsored by like weissenstaufen or something like some spotten balls energy drink yeah classy (laughs) classy drink from the early 2000s nolan how are you doing (laughs) i'm doing all right doing all right nolan and i just got back from a pretty intense uh road trip yeah i've kind of been like recovering this week uh even though we got back like tuesday of last week i still feel like i'm still getting in the the swing of things getting back into the real world post high low because it wasn't just the trip that was really intense uh you know it took like a month to shoot the whole show and when you're on high low we really it does really feel like it's its own world because like the build is the only thing that we do really it's like we wake up in the morning go to the office work on the trucks um do bits to the camera and then come home and do it all again for a month uh it's pretty taxing gotta say and big old shouts and huge respect to anybody who works on trucks for a living I thought working on cars was hard. Trucks is like working on cars, but everything weighs four times as much. Everything is so much heavier. Yes. It's so big. It's like we were insane. working on little Toyotas. Like I can't imagine working on big trucks <laughs> yeah. all the time. Like everything is so heavy. Absolutely. No, it was really fun. Uh, it was really crazy and I can't wait for uh, everyone to see it. Hell yeah. I can't wait to see it. Okay. First things first. We must pay fealty to the undisputed king of professional cheaters, Hall of Fame NASCAR mechanic, Smokey Eunuch, who you guys have hopefully uh, learned about. Smokey's cars. He's a real one. Bear Bear the freaking goat. My favorite, one one of my favorite favorite guys in automotive history. That's right. Uh, Smokey's cars won 57 races, including two championships, and he became legendary for his workarounds to the stock car rule book. Fun fact, the Heinz 57 is named Heinz 57 because Smokey Unit won 57 races. Dang, wow, a lot of people don't know that. Different types of races. Yeah, people didn't know. Yeah, people don't know that. Um, such legendary cheats, including installing extra fuel line to hold more gas, inflating a basketball inside his car's tank to disguise its fuel capacity, and even building a car that was rumored to be seven eighths scale to the real thing. That's probably my favorite one. But we're not going to talk about him today because we've already done uh, the two aforementioned episodes on him. But before we move on, let's note the best thing about Smokey Eunuch. Since it's also true of a lot of the other folks we're going to talk about, he was a completely unapologetic cheat. Smokey even wrote about the extra long fuel line in his autobiography saying, quote, Uh, was this car a cheater? (laughs) You bet it was. (laughs) (laughs) Smokey Unix's exploits may have carried him to the International Motorsports Hall of Fame, but he never completely dominated his sport the way that Red Bull Racing blitzed the F1 championship from 2010 to 2013. During its first four years in Formula One, Team Red Bull finished a modest 7th, 7th, 5th, and 7th in the season standings. Uh, frankly, yeah, that's probably where you're going to finish in your first couple of years. But in 2009, they leapt into second place, led by 22-year-old driver Sebastian Vettel, who then went on to capture the next four consecutive F1 championships. And in the process, Vettel became F1's youngest champion ever and also set records with nine consecutive race wins and 13 total wins in a season. There goes Sebi. But the Renault-powered cars that Vettel drove were generally parked squarely in the gray areas of the F1 rulebook. This was especially true in 2012 when Vettel drove an almost definitely illegal car to the title. In addition to the fact that Vettel nicknamed this car Kinky Kylie, which should be disqualifying on Weird Vibes <laughs> yeah, Alone, that's weird. it had a- <laughs> so weird. <dude. laughs> 
The uh, the car had a flexible front wing, which became known as Vettel's rubber nose. It, I think it's funny, like how twenty, like just in nine years, you know, if like some if a driver th- these days was like, oh yeah, I call my car Kinky Kylie, like somebody on his team would be like, you know what, man, like let's not. Do that. Hey man, this is not good optics. Yeah. Like this doesn't look cool, man. <laughs> no, he still nicknames his cars. I know, but he probably did, like. Uh, no, last season, or no, sorry, this season, uh, Vettel, his uh, his Aston Martin is named Honey Rider, named after the first Bond girl in the first Bond film, Doctor No, because it's British. Well, yeah, because oh, oh yeah, it's a. James Bond, it's Aston Martin. I, I'm putting it together right now. That just shows that he's old now. Definitely, because his last year at Ferrari, uh, his his car was named Lucia. Um, let's see. It looks around like 2011. Yeah, 2011 was Kinky Kylie, and then Abby, and then Hungry Heidi, and then in 2009, Vettel's uh, Red Bull. His second his second year with the team, the he his car was named Kate. And then he crashed Kate, and the chassis had to be replaced. And the Kate, and then the car was named Kate's Dirty Sister. God, Seb, come I on, mean, man. He was, I mean, he was like what, twenty three at the time. Yeah, he's horny as hell. <laughs> yeah, man. Remember how horny you were, twenty three? <laughs> hey, shouts to all the twenty three year olds out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> enjoy it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for keeping it together for all the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, <laughs> hold it in. <laughs> just hang in there don't do anything dumb you'll, you'll calm down a little bit well speaking of calming down the <laughs> the rubber nose the wing was actually made of layered carbon composites which were stiff enough to pass tech inspection at legal ride height while the car was standing still but at racing speed the air pressure and resistance caused the wing to flex outward and down, which lowered the gap between the car and the surface of the track, giving the Red Bull an aerodynamic advantage over the other race cars. Despite the fact that movable aerodynamics had been banned back in 1969, F1 didn't crack down on the rubber nose until after it had run and won a full season. The rubber nose was banned for 2013, but that didn't stop Red Bull from pushing the envelope again. First, they secretly introduced a new, questionably legal traction control system that linked their car's hybrid engine to its suspension. Then they tried to sneak a redesigned front wing through qualifying for the final race of the 2014 season, for which the team was penalized and forced to start the race from the back. Uh, another thing about the 2014 season, uh, that was Daniel Ricciardo's first season with Red Bull. And he actually won the first race in his home track in Australia. Oh, nice. But, but uh, Red Bull was kind of cheating again. They, they had too much fuel going through their, their fuel system, and Daniel was disqualified. No. Uh, f- yeah. That was the first race I ever watched. Red Bull continues to be a leading innovator and or leading rule bender in Formula 1, depending on who you ask. But Vettel left Red Bull after the 2014 season. And it's worth noting that the Wonderkin hasn't won a championship without Red Bull's controversial cards. Low on his side. blow. Yeah, well, he, he hopped over to Ferrari, and Ferrari was going through a rough patch, and then now he's with Aston Martin. And I don't know if I see it happening with them, but, you know. Well, I mean, he got, happen. well, he got second, and then he got disqualified this yeah, last right. race. That yeah, that hurt. Yeah. Hurt man, that was a great drive, <laughs> <sighs> James. What did that hurt? It hurt though. No, no, no. just continue. Okay, <laughs> Red Bull's cheating was PhD level smart. In fact, I'm sure there were a bunch of PhDs uh, working for him. Uh, but our next swindlers were more desperate than Brainy. This is a story about a team that crashed on purpose to win a race. Prior to making cars for Red Bull, Renault had their own F1 team. That team reached the peak of the sport, winning world championship titles in 2005 and 2006 under the management of Flavio Briatore. But by late 2008, Renault hadn't won a race in nearly two years, and rumor had it that the company was thinking of leaving the sport. This set the stage for the Singapore Grand Prix, which was both the first F1 race in the city and the first night race in F1 history. Really? In 2008? Hmm. Hmm. 
Renault had two drivers entered. Former world champion Fernando Alonso, uh, a oh, guy yeah. that Nolan oh, totally simps. And the 20... <laughs> <laughs> you're... Let's... Okay. I can't help it, man. Admit it, Nolan. Admit it. it. You're an Alonso simp. Make him oh, admit it, bit, Joe. Yeah. Make him admit Dude, it, Joe. Who's, who, who do you like more, though? Danny Rick or... Or Fernando. Ooh, oh, Alonzo for sure. J- Nolan, just say the whole Who thing. I like more? Nolan, say the whole thing. Danny Rick did a shoey. No, say I am <laughs> Say I am oh. an Alonzo simp. <laughs> yeah, I do. I simp Alonzo. He's a beautiful man. He looks like Jesus. He's a he's a Span, Spaniard daddy. Like, come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> their other driver was 23-year-old son of racing legend Nelson Piquet Jr., both drivers ran well in practice, but qualified in a disappointing 15th and 16th position, which seemed to foreshadow another sure loss for Renault. So, Briatore came up with a plan. Up until this point in his life, Flavio Briatore had not exactly demonstrated strong moral fiber, which is totally unusual for anyone involved in F1. <laughs> uh, in the mid-80s, he was convicted on multiple counts of fraud by running an elaborate con in which a cast of fictional characters tricked rich dinner guests into playing a rigged card game that according to judges made Briatore a chunk of change rather than serve prison time he fled Italy for the US uh, Virgin Islands where he opened several Bennington clothing stores that made him a lot of money wow turn lemons into lemonade yeah he then used his (laughs) friendship with Luciano Benetton and eventual amnesty from Italian courts to become the head of Benetton Formula Racing. What? Uh, Renault bought Team Benetton in 2000, and Briatore had been running the team ever since. How did he just get off scot-free? That's crazy. Money? <laughs> Is that... <laughs> Uh, after that long and fraudulent journey to the world of racing, Briatore found himself in Singapore and in desperate need of a win. So he implemented an unusual strategy. Rather than load up on fuel uh, to try and cut out unnecessary pit stops, as was standard for low starters, Alonso's car would start the race light on fuel. Briatore said this would help Alonso run fast early and make up for the bad starting position. Uh, (laughs) The plan didn't work. In the 12th lap, Alonso became the first car to enter the pits and subsequently rejoined the race in dead last. It's going to be okay, Nolan. But then the second (laughs) secret part of Briatore's plan kicked in. During the 15th lap, Piquet Jr. hit a wall at turn 17, one of the only turns on the track without a crane, which meant that a safety car had to be deployed. Oh, convenient. According to F1 rules at the time, the pit lane was immediately closed down until all cars had bunched up behind the safety car instantly eliminating the advantage of the lead cars. This is the rule Briatore took advantage of. Pretty clever. (laughs) Uh, Reading this sounds like Danny Ocean is describing his plan. This is amazing. I freaking love this guy. Once the field car lines up behind the pace car, the pits open. Uh, All the drivers immediately made their stops except for one because Alonzo had already pitted. He was able to move into first place behind the pace car while everyone else was stopped and eventually won the race for Alonzo is so pitted. Uh, To the outside world, it seemed like a great stroke of luck for Renault that Bertori's strategy ended up putting Alonzo in position to win, even if it was also somewhat of a coincidence that his teammates crash contributed to the victory. But... There was very little public suspicion that Renault had fixed the race, mostly because no one thought they'd be crazy enough to purposefully throw a driver at a wall. But then, a year later, PK Jr. left the team on bad terms, and soon afterwards, it was reported in PK's native Brazil that Briatore had ordered him to crash during the Singapore race. F1 immediately announced an inquiry. Renault was eventually charged with conspiracy by F1's governing body, which forced the recognitions of Briatore and the team's head of engineering, Pat Simmons. Uh, Alonso was cleared of wrongdoing, while Piquet Jr. was given immunity in exchange for his testimony. Mm, you little narc. You narc snitch. You snitch. <laughs> snitch. <laughs> Bertori was banned from F1 for life, and although the sentence was later overturned in French court, he hasn't returned to the sport. 
Remember what we said about unapologetic cheaters a little earlier? Well, if you listen to Bria Tori tell it, the on-purpose accident was actually noble. <laughs> of course. As he told Sky Sports afterwards, quote, I was a trying to save the team. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a Wario that just keeps getting out of prison <laughs> and like off from his crimes. They are pretty silly crimes, you know? <laughs> like, really, like, his crimes were, like, they all involved, like, games. Yeah, and they're, they're like, schemy and kind of clever. Yeah, like, it's like, so what was he in trouble for initially? Like, a card game? Okay, yeah. cool. And he's t- who is he taking advantage of? A bunch of rich people who were playing a card game? Great. I don't <laughs> care. Great. Let him go. <laughs> Keep going, bro. Uh, and then what? A f- another game that we all take way too seriously where a bunch of like little tiny guys drive around in really fast cars that are too expensive. Great. <laughs> and he convinced like some little rich kid to crash into a wall. <laughs> Hell yeah. This guy rules. And both of their lives like were great after that. Yeah, they were both great. And before that. Yeah, he like made a snitch crash into a wall. Sure. <laughs> Autumn is in the air, the pumpkins are in the patch, and our friends at Manscaped are here to make sure you don't carve your pants pumpkins when you're grooming. You know what I'm saying. Make sure you're keeping things fresh this fall with the leaders in male grooming and their brand new fourth generation performance package. Hey boys, get ready for a cuffing season like no other. Ready to take the leap into fall with Manscaped? Join the 2 million men worldwide using Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20. The new Performance Package 4.0 includes the Lawnmower 4.0. If you're looking to cozy up this fall, this trimmer is essential. This fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It also gives you the ability to turn on the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for more precise shave, plus it's waterproof. Honestly, I really love Manscaped products. I use them weekly. I use the lawnmower all the time. They're really quality products and they have lasted me at least a year so far. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. Make your balls a priority this fall. Choose Manscaped and your balls will thank you. Thanks, Manscaped. Big thanks to Craig Tools for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. If you like woodworking like I do, uh, whether you're amateur or professional, the Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro is a perfect tool for woodworking and carpentry alike. It's created to be easier to use than ever. It works with a variety of materials. We're talking wood, plywood, anything that you wanna build stuff out of. It's designed for portable use and can be used on a bench top as well. I really like it because I am not great at woodworking, but it makes it so easy to just make flush little discreet holes so you can join stuff. The VersaGrip handle rotates 360 degrees, which is really convenient. Now anyone can easily create perfect and strong pocket hole joints with the Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro. It works with a variety and size of material and is great for building all types of indoor and outdoor wood projects. The Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro comes with everything you need and retails for just $99.99. It's available nationwide at Home Depot, Lowe's, and other home centers, woodworking, and hardware stores. Learn more at craigtool.com. That's K-R-E-G tool.com. Thank you, Craig. Michelle Mouton was a boundary-breaking rally driver in the early 1980s, who Autosport Magazine once described as, quote, motorsport's most successful ever female driver. Between the 1981 and 1982 seasons, she took four World Rally Championship race wins and a second-place overall finish in 82. She also executed one of the most audacious cheats in racing history. Well, I did not know this. I am a big fan of Michelle. We've done an episode on her, and I never knew she was a cheater. By 1985, Mouton had mostly stepped back from driving in WRC events to race smaller circuits and focus on having a family. But she did race once that season, the Rally Bandama in the Ivory Coast of Africa. Even for the grueling sport of rally, which generally takes place over several days and hundreds of miles, this rally was seen as particularly arduous to the point that it had a tough time recruiting entries. Only 1 in 10 entrants generally reached the finish line, 
1972, 45 cars started the race, but zero finished. Sheesh. Big sheesh. Big sheesh. Big sheesh. The guy at the finish line was like, I paid way more for these tickets. Uh, sorry, son. <laughs> <laughs> He's got he's got like flat beer and a shoe just like ready to be drank. Yeah, he's got a flat beer. He's like, I know this is uh this was my weekend to win your love back and I'm 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 sorry, son. That guy sounds like he's related to Jim Henson. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> It's not yeah. easy being green. <laughs> You're not going to want to spend another weekend with me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Back to your mom's house. <laughs> not a single car. <laughs> I had to get a malaria shot for this. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry about all the shots. <laughs> the kid's arm is like black and blue. I know. He has to tell everyone that he doesn't hit his kid. I know that you wanted to see some rally cars. <laughs> Turns out it was a really <laughs> tough course. Meanwhile, in 1985, Mouton had reached the end of the race's first day in first place, but her engine was spewing smoke. Other teams expected her to retire, but Mouton surprised them by starting the next stage. She was soon forced to pull off the route in the African jungle so that her engineer, who was following in a mechanically identical support car, could make repairs. Mm, how convenient. At the time, WRC cars didn't have cameras, and there was no helicopters shadowing the competitors. After an hour and a half, Mutan emerged from the jungle with her car miraculously cured, and no sign of her support car. Oh. The official explanation given by Audi was that a faulty oil pump in Mutan's Quattro had been replaced, forcing the support Quattro to retire. But... Audi quickly faced accusations that they hadn't swapped oil pumps, but rather swapped out the entire cars by transplanting the rally car's panels onto the healthy support car. I mean, is that easier? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's just do a body swap. Like, an oil pump is a relatively <laughs> low-impact job. <laughs> For evidence, onlookers noted that a hood-mounted fog light system had disappeared from the base of Mouton's windshield. Audi denied the claims, saying that the windshield had also been swapped because the anti-fog system had failed. But amid mounting suspicion, the team withdrew Mouton just before the finish line. This cheating story technically remains unsolved. Mouton has never admitted wrongdoing, and the race stewards couldn't find proof of anything illicit. But let's be real here. She probably swapped Audis in the middle of the jungle and almost got away with it. You mean her car's not broken and you're not even going <laughs> to let her finish? What if what if you just let her finish and it didn't count? Uh, <laughs> Millions of people know the name Jimmy Johnson. Even casual sports fans have heard of him thanks to seven career NASCAR Cup championships plus crossover success in sports media and pop culture. That's right. Fewer people know the name Chad Knauss, but 81 of Johnson's 83 career wins have come with Knauss as his crew chief, making Knauss the only crew chief in NASCAR <laughs> history to win five consecutive championships and the only one to win seven total titles. Wow. He may be the greatest crew chief in racing history. He's also been suspended four times for rule violations. Ooh. Oh. You don't want rule violations, baby. You don't want to violate them rules. No, don't you violate my rules. <laughs> you can <you laughs> violate my rule. How would you come over later and violate some of my rules? <laughs> you can violate the rules of man, the rules of law, but don't violate my rules, yeah. okay? Don't violate Boy. the rules of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first, in 2001, he got hit with a two-race ban for a relatively mild seatbelt violation. Then, just before Jimmy Johnson won his first Daytona 500 in 2006, Canals was sent home because the rear window of Johnson's Chevy 
had an illegal device installed to make it more aerodynamic. Uh, Canals was later fined $25,000 and suspended for four races. Oof. For his third violation, during the debut of NASCAR's Car of Tomorrow in 2007, uh, Johnson's car failed inspection because the shape of the fenders fell outside of the body template. Canals was fined 100 large and suspended for six races. Finally, in 2012, Johnson's car again failed pre-race inspection at Daytona, this time for an illegally shaped C-pillar. Canals got another $100,000 fine, another six-race ban, and this time Johnson was docked 25 points in the standings. Why, though? Why, why does it... A C-pillar doesn't really change the shape of the car that much unless there's like it does i mean nascar they they actually have like a huge jig like that looks like like a comically large like cookie cutter yeah oh i was gonna that, say it was like that show where you have to make uh <laughs> shapes with your body and go through like yeah. the the. <laughs> that's pretty funny yeah. joe but <laughs> but they have like they put it on top of the car like no you're shape. right james like any like even if it seems like a small kind of thing at the speeds that these cars are going at and in relation to the other cars, like when you guys are going at 195 through a banked corner, you know, super close together where you're, where you can be touching any sort of variation in the shape of these cars is going to affect the air around everybody, you know? So any, any sort of small variation can affect, you know, can give you an advantage and There's that's a great- why they use, that's why they use those jigs. Yeah, there's a great uh, interview with Travis Pastrana where he describes like his experience driving a stock car. Yeah, um, you should just Google it. I'm sure it'll come up. Travis Pastrana. Is he like, car. yeah, it's super easy because I'm really talented. <laughs> <Or>? No, he, <laughs> but he no, he just talks about how you're so close together, and like Nolan said, you're at such speed, and both all the cars are just shooting so much air off of yeah. them. Dirty, that, dirty air. Yeah, that anything you do or anything that anyone around you does affects everything so much Whoa! so like you're just like if you lose your Ah! then everyone else wrecks too and that's why you know so often in nascar if one person wrecks everybody wrecks yeah okay i didn't i never knew that but it makes sense like uh after watching nascar and like going to nascar races like i really do it really does feel like a paper airplane race in a lot of ways where it's just like passing is such like a long game. Yeah. And it's just you have to plan it like 10 laps in advance. And right. Yeah. Like wind is such a huge thing. After that, Knauss's bosses at Hendrick Motorsport appealed the ruling and eventually all the non-financial penalties were rescinded by an impartial in quotes, arbiter. I want to be an arbiter who just so happened to be a former GM executive who is also friends with Rick Hendrick. <laughs> I think you'd be a good arbiter, but I think you'd be a better harbinger. <laughs> oh, I am a harbinger of doom. <laughs> uh, all that doesn't even mention the time that Canals was caught on camera before a race instructing Johnson that if they won, Johnson should do some celebratory donuts afterwards and try to crack his rear bumper to avoid a post-race inspection. That's cool. Mm-hmm. From these incidents, you could reasonably describe Knaus as a cheating enthusiast with a racing hobby on the side, but evidently Knaus got tired of breaking rules in the pits because in 2020, he stepped down from being a crew chief to join Hendrick as a vice president. Now he can break rules the American way as a corporate suit. <laughs> Boom. Freaking got him. Now, nah, man, that's what you got to do in NASCAR, man. You got to bend those rules. You got to find the limits. You got to push it. Everybody's doing it, you know? Dude, I think cheating in sports is hilarious, and I encourage it. People are still <laughs> I, talking about, like, years ago how Tom Brady had, like, a semi-deflated ball. It's like, who get cares? over it. What? Who I don't cares? mean, I, I hate the Patriots. Dude, get make, over it. Make all steroids legal. Freaking. <laughs> yeah. There's like, uh, to me, the rule changes in, mo- in like all of racing is why it could be so much more popular. It's just so, it's so hard to get into and so hard to like be There's a fan. There's so many rules, man. There's just they so keep many changing like... the, And they keep changing them all. Every sport, there should be a limit to eight rules. You only get eight <laughs> rules. <laughs> Everyone gets and, to vote 
on them. Yeah, and yeah, all the players get to vote on them. Yeah, the players should make all the rules. Anyway, there's just so much like whininess, especially in Formula One, when you see like, oh, Mercedes doesn't want Red Bull to have fast pit stops. So they're saying it's dangerous and it's just like, stop whining. Just let them have. It's so impressive to see a 1.8 second pit stop. Just let them do that. Mm hmm. Big thank you again to our sponsor this week, Auto Tempest. Auto Tempest is the used car search engine that makes it super easy to check a bunch of different sites for used car listings. Pulls up all the top listing sites in the US and some in Canada. You can find everything you want in one place and you can tell that it was built by automotive enthusiasts, car nerds, weirdos like me. I'm always looking for a Dodge Neon SRT. I'm not in the market to buy one, I just like looking at them. But the fact that the Neon and the Neon SRT are two separate search options, that's how you know that the site was built by car nerds. All right, different model, different engine, different car. You can also use Auto Tempest to open matching results at classified sites like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist as well. It's super easy. No more going from site to site. Find all the cars in one place at autotempest.com. All the cars, one search. Head on over to autotempest.com slash past gas. I'm going to go there right now and try to find a BMW M240i. Thank you, Auto Tempest. Big thank you to Monday.com for sponsoring today's episode. Every organization has its own secret sauce that makes it unique. Whether it's your product, your people, or your culture, the software you use should help support what makes you successful, not force you to change to fit to its rigid rules. That's why we love using Monday.com. Monday.com WorkOS is a flexible platform that fits any organization and any department, so you can create workflows that fit your needs. What is Monday.com's WorkOS? Well, it's a customizable platform that gives teams the ability to easily create the work software they need and want for their organization. This freedom means you can build anything, a CRM workflow, HR management system, marketing dashboards, you name it, Monday.com WorkOS has got it. I've used Monday.com. I know that it's easy to use, and I know how valuable that is for teams to get their stuff done. Monday.com is how effective teams meet their goals. If you manage a team, visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Create the perfect workflow for your team with Monday.com WorkOS. To start your free 14-day trial, go to Monday.com. Thank you, Monday.com, for sponsoring this episode. Past Gas is supported by First Republic Bank. With the best in-class banking app that allows you to bank anywhere, anytime, and a dedicated personal banker when you need one-on-one service. First Republic is uniquely positioned to offer the best of both worlds. With this combination of personal attention and convenience, it's no wonder that First Republic Bank has a client satisfaction rating two times the industry average. So whether you're opening a personal line of credit or planning for your retirement, you can count on First Republic to be there for you every step of the way. Visit firstrepublic.com today to learn more. That's firstrepublic.com. Member FDIC Equal Housing Lender. You know, when I think about banking, convenience is a major factor and First Republic knows that too. So I love that they're only a push of a button away from assistance if I ever need it. Uh, And I want to encourage all of our past guest listeners to check them out. Long before Chad Knauss and Jimmy Johnson, Tim Flock was the one skirting NASCAR rules. But this is less of a story of a guy who cheated his way to the top and more a story of a guy who got cheated out of his top spot. Flock was an early NASCAR legend who won two Grand National Series championships in the 1950s. Along the way, he set a record for most pole positions in a season that still stands and also drove several races with a monkey as his co-pilot. Which is really cool in a sport that doesn't have (laughs) (laughs) co-pilots. The monkey was named Jocko Flacco. Nice. Unfortunately, (laughs) Jocko was retired after he got hit by a pebble mid-race, forcing Tim Flock to make a pit stop that cost him the win. (laughs) Well, good on him. It's like, don't worry, Jocko. We'll get you (laughs) some help, buddy. I love you more than I love this win. <laughs> yeah. I'm coming in, Barry. Jocko got hit. Dude, I gotta know. I gotta know more about Jocko Flacco. I think I speak for the Jocko. listeners here when we gotta learn more about this this monkey. <laughs> I'm I'm ninety percent certain that this 
monkey smoked. It's, oh, yeah. He's got to smoke. Cigarettes. If you have a monkey yeah. co-pilot, you got to <laughs> hand that yeah. thing a Marlboro Red every once in a while. <laughs> it's contractually <laughs> obligated. <laughs> Flock was a hugely popular driver for NASCAR chief Bill France, but Flock was also from the Atlanta Moonshiner group of racers. And if you listen to our episode about Raymond Parks, you know that France didn't much like those guys. France wanted that clean image for the sport, and uh, Flock did, Tim Flock did not uh, embody that, and thus became yeah, a Flock victim. Was, uh... Flock was the kind of guy who had a monkey as a co-pilot. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, he's just the kind of guy who you, <laughs> he drives with a chimp. <laughs> oh, he's technically not a monkey. It's, it's in a great ape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, uh, uh, Jocko Flocko looks like a little capuchin, not a chimp. Oh, he's a little Ooh, small, so he's a little monkey. small. Yeah, a little. That monkey, seems like something a... they that's going to be in the rules someday. Of like, you can have a chimp, but not a monkey, <laughs> and it's got to be. <laughs> oh, it's got to be guy. able to smoke. I don't know. I don't know if he smoked. He's a little. No, that'd be a big cigarette. In <laughs> yeah, he'd get, he get real. He was a rhesus. Jocko Flocko was a rhesus monkey. So you know the little black and white ones. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, really cute. Like from Friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, Maurice, right? Ma yeah, Maurice or Marcel? Marcel. Marcel. Thank you. Anyway, uh, back to Tim Flock and Bill France. In their first run-in, Bill France stripped Flock of his 1950 Modified Series title, claiming that Flock had run an unsanctioned race on a, quote, outlaw track, which disqualified him from winning. That sucks. That, that's lame, dude. Then, in 1952, Flock finished a race at France's Daytona Beach track 18 seconds ahead of Jack Smith, but Smith was flagged the winner. Flock appealed for a scoring check, which proved that he had beaten Smith, but Smith then protested that Flock had run the race with wooden roll bars, an arrangement that France had initially approved after Flock showed up with any roll bars at all. <laughs> Nevertheless, Smith's protest was accepted, and France gave him the win. Flock was awarded last place. Yeah. Man, I'm so thankful for like smartphones now because you can record everything. If this happened in 2021, he could have, you know, Flock could have just had his phone running and had France sign off on it and then appealed it later. But like, look, dude, you told me this was all right. Dude, you signed the DocuSign. <laughs> <laughs> Flock, Tim Flock had yet another win stripped in 1954. During a post-race inspection, officials found the butterfly shaft on Flock's carburetor had been soldered to keep it from vibrating loose. Flock argued that the soldering was just to prevent potential problems, but the race officials gave the win to none other than Lee Petty. I believe that's Richard Petty's dad. But the greatest injustice of all came in 1961 when Flock tried to help fellow driver Curtis Turner and Teamsters leader Jimmy Hoffa Whoa. to form a driver's union. France was adamantly against unionization and threatened to bar any driver or track that supported it. Eventually, all the drivers except for Flock and Turner folded under France's pressure. Both Flock and Turner were banned from NASCAR for life. Damn. Flock was reinstated five years later, but by that point, he was through with driving. Whether that was because he was sick of racing or sick of Bill France remains a mystery, although I think I know the answer. <laughs> I think it's because his monkey was, like, getting pretty big in the circus scene, and he wanted to... <laughs> well, his monkey got the job on Friends. Oh, okay. No, nah, that was Marcel's, like, great-grandpa. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. No, the timeline doesn't add up. Thanks yeah. for clarifying <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, we saved Dude. the craziest cheater on today's list for last because we know what you diehards stick around for. Pure, uncut insanity. <laughs> <laughs> that was a film that I made uh, when I was very young. And, uh, I was, I was new in Hollywood and, uh, I was taken advantage of, uh, uncut insanity is the only way to possibly describe what Romano Fanati did to try and win the 2018 San Marino motorcycle grand prix. 
Fanati and Stefano Manzi have been battling throughout the Moto2 race, which culminated in the two bikers making contact and running off the track. This dust-up cost both riders enough time to drop them well behind the leaders. Presumably, neither rider was pleased, but Fanati felt that Manzi had been overly aggressive trying to pass him. He was also the one who had previously kicked a rival during warm-ups, then flipped the guy's kill switch in a practice run. So, naturally, he was a guy, he went a... <laughs> On the back straight, Fanati approached Manzi from behind and grabbed the other rider's brake lever while both were traveling at 140 miles an hour. Oh my god. Monzi somehow managed to stay on his bike and briefly regained control, but he crashed in the next turn. Renati was immediately disqualified, and the damage to his racing career was swift. He was fired by his racing team and dropped from the team that had signed him for the following season. A human rights group in Italy even recommended he face attempted murder charges. Sheesh. Four days after the race, Renati retired from racing completely, but... In his retirement announcement, he also seemed to partially recant his apology for the brake grab. He told the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, quote, Nobody cares about my pain. I was not the real man. I cannot handle anger. But also, Manzi could have killed me. <laughs> it's probably unsurprising then that several months later, Renati was back. He unretired in 2019 to race in Moto3, where he continues to compete to this day. Well, those are just a select few of the many incredible cheaters in the long history of motorsport. And it makes sense that there are a lot of them. People who love cars inherently want them to go as fast as possible. Most of us love to tinker, so we're constantly modifying our engines to make them even more perfect than they were yesterday. If you combine that with the mindset of someone who loves sports, aka someone who loves to win, it's no surprise then that lots of people at the highest levels of racing are willing to bend or outright break rules in order to get to victory lane. And look, cheating isn't cool, but we watch racing because we want to see good drivers go fast. And for the most part, the people who cheat are just making that exact thing happen. So all I'm saying, circumstantially, is that maybe sometimes cheaters aren't that dirty or rotten after all. Everybody's bending the rules. They just haven't been caught yet. Yeah. Except for the dude who grabbed the brake handle. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's messed up. That's gross. <laughs> um, guys, I got bad news. Uh, turns out Flavio Briatore is a huge piece of <laughs> So uh, I just want to go on public record and say yeah. he's not my hero <laughs> and I don't want him to mentor me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Passcast. It's good to be back in the saddle. Good to be back talking with you guys for sure. Yeah, this is um, fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to Passcast once again, guys. If you want to get in touch with the show, hit us up at Passcast at DonutMedia.com. Uh, let us know if there's a story you want to talk about or, uh, you know, just any feedback. We do we do read the reader mail. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Uh, if you'd like, all right, be kind. Keep it juiced. I love you. See you next time.